There you go. And uh, welcome everyone. Welcome to the second day of the ICAM Global Summit. And we've just had our general meeting and we're now coming into the science sessions. We have three things occurring today. Uh, we have first uh, a talk by Yuanbo, uh, Yuanbo, who's going to tell us about 2D materials and we'll be introduced in a minute. Then we're going to have a, uh, a, a roundtable discussion on science uh, in the era of the H-Index, uh, followed by a talk by uh, JP Paglioni, who's going to tell us about uh, training the next generation of uh, quantum material scientists. So um, I'm now going to hang hand over to uh, Puchan, who's going to introduce today's speaker and open the session. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Piers. So I'd like to um, open the session. Uh, I'm Fuchen Zhang from University of Chinese Academy of Sciences. Um, my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, uh, the first speaker today, Yuan Bo Zhang from Fudan University, a member of the uh, I can. Uh, Yuan Bo received a BS degree from Peking University and a PhD from Columbia University with uh, Philip Kim. After his PhD, he was a Miller Research Fellow at UC Berkeley. He joined Fudan University as a faculty member in 2011. So since, since he returned to China, Yuan Bo has built a uh, modern laboratory and uh, worked on um, transport and the screen, uh, scanning part of lower dimensional systems, uh, including uh, graphene, black phosphorus, and the high TC cuprate among them. He has a number of uh, interesting results, which he, he will share us today in his uh, talk, which is entitled Advent of two dimensional materials. Uh, please, Yuan Bu. Uh, Thank you for, for the introduction. Uh, so, so, please, me, yeah, uh, me... uh, please mute. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, can you see my screen? Okay, great. Okay. Yes. So, okay, great. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers, uh, Pierre, for his presentation. Uh, so uh, today uh, I will talk about the um, our, uh, our uh, the two-dimensional materials uh, through uh, the lens of our own research uh, in the in the past uh, uh, fifteen years. So. Uh, before I get into the uh, two D materials, uh, let's look at the uh, the material uh, from a, a bigger pr perspective. So, so we found that uh, our early human history was in fact uh, defined by materials. So we have a Stone Age, Bronze Age, and Iron Age, and all these materials uh, at the time. Well, uh, if we follow this convention and define our own age. Uh, I, I, I think we have no objection in the audience that uh, the, uh, uh, perhaps the best choice of our age will be silicon. So, so the, uh, basically the, our, uh, the modern information society was built on uh, the silicon uh, uh, for, uh, for competition and even for, for energy harvesting. Okay. Well, the why a silicon is so useful? Um, well, um, so it's a semiconductor. That means you can make conductive or insulating just by giving a little bit of perturbation, okay? And this is the, actually the underlying mechanism of a transistor that was first built in Bell Labs in, in, in the 40s. Well, the trick is that you have to make the material very really thin so that, so that it's an interface, and the interface actually is a device. So then you can, you can uh, quite uh, more and more, 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 more and more of these transistors on the chip and the transistor, according to Moore's law, will be more and more powerful, okay? And at this age, the transistor is already shrinking down to nanometer scale. So, so you can imagine that you can pack billions and billions of this transistor uh, and you have to make it smaller and smaller, okay? And at a few nanometer scale, uh, so you're basically approaching the time limit. 
And ultimately, you can hit the brick wall, which is the single atom. Uh, you have to make this transistor single atom stick, right? And this actually doesn't work for a three-dimensional material such as silicon. Because uh, as you go to Mount Lear, the silicon will make bonds with something else. It will lose its semiconductor property. Well, there's a, a, a classic material, that's a layer material, and uh, uh, that uh, could retain its intrinsic chemical stability uh, even as a single atom uh, uh, thickness. Well, so the first such known uh, uh, such material was a uh, graphene that was uh, was obtain obtained uh, uh, for the first time by Gaim Group in 2004, and so so that was quite that created quite a bit of excitement uh, uh, in 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 the in the, in the 2000s. Uh, so in the past 16 years, we have learned a lot about the, the graphene. Uh, for example, uh, so we, we learned that uh, in, in graphene, the electron uh, has the, uh, a, a dispersion, linear dispersion. Uh, so there's no band gap, okay? Uh, so uh, on, on, if you look at V function on this uh, parabolic, uh, has this uh, uh, dracon, the function actually has the pseudo spin that is aligned with the momentum. Uh, so, so in this sense, uh, in graphene, we, we have this uh, direct fermions in two dimension. And this has led to uh, the, the so-called half integer cone Hall effect, where the RS, RSX go to zero, uh, a certain uh, magnetic field, and the R to Y, the inverse of R to Y quantized to the half integer uh, 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 values of four e square over H. Okay. And this is the consequence of the linear discretion relation and also the pseudo spin. Uh, the fact that the, the, the electron has pseudo spin in, in graphene. Well, this, of course, uh, gives give rise to a lot of interest in physics in graphene, but on our, our hand, you notice that it doesn't have a band gap. So, so unlike silicon, you cannot build a, uh, a, a transistor, a good transistor with graphene because you cannot, simply cannot turn it off. So it won't, uh, it won't function as a very good uh, optical switch uh, as a transistor. Well, uh, but looking back, I think the, uh, the, 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 uh, the most important thing we have learned uh, uh, from graphene was not that actually is maybe a we can build transistor from it, but uh, it's a new paradigm uh, uh, from which we can we work with the uh, linear materials. Uh, the paradigm which we call less is different, if I, uh, if I may steal with from uh, Phil Anderson's uh, famous phrase. So the idea that uh, even for a, a well-known a well-studied uh, material like graphite, if you send it down to Mount Lear, you will have a totally different material. For example, you, all, you all see the electron will behave totally differently. So it, it becomes a direct, uh, uh, a direct fermion. Well, so, uh, so this is what, what I call, you see essentially you have to treat graphene as the totally new material. And so this is applied to graphene, but if you look around to, at other materials, this is uh, a very general scheme. So for example, in metal dicarbonates, uh, if you go to Mount Lear, you have all, you have all the valley tonics uh, that, uh, uh, that come up uh, only in the Mount Lear's. Uh, so according to Mount Lear, uh, you know, uh, so there are actually thousands of 2D crystals that are waiting to be explored. Um, so they, they encompass, encompass a, a wide variety of physics uh, from uh, magnetism to uh, uh, to supernativity or to even static supernativity. Okay, so there's a a, a vast opportunity. Uh, uh, so with this uh, with this uh, uh, new way of looking at these million materials, or better yet, well, all this at your fingertips. If you have uh, if you just have a a uh, a roll of magic tape that you can pick up at any stationery store. Well. Uh, here I should say, well, it also makes you wonder. So why we have to wait uh, till 2004 uh, to discover that a, a, a scar tape could peel Mount Lear from, from graphite or from other linear material. And indeed, actually, if you look back, uh, back in, in the 60s and 70s, uh, so there's the, a, uh, there's the, so the, the professor at uh, a Simon Fraser University in Canada, uh, Professor Frint, and he discovered that you can use a similar tip, because a cello tip at the time, to peel uh, linear materials such as the nabi and the selenite uh, down to uh, possibly bilayer. Okay, 
and he discovered actually the TC actually decreased uh, as you send it down to, to fill limit, lim uh, fill layer limit. And uh, so he actually uh, worked on a few other materials and, and, and it works equally well. Well, but unfortunately, his discovery was uh, largely forgotten uh, in the 2D material community or in the, in the condensed matter community. Uh, but if you look at the, the, the things that happened between 60s and now, uh, there's a long list of uh, discoveries or uh, technical advancement during the time. And you understand why uh, we, we as a community didn't get the chance, didn't grasp the chance, okay, uh, uh, the opportunity. And we were prepared neither in technology nor in physics 50 years ago. But luckily now, we, uh, so we are as a position uh, to, to run with the idea and uh, uh, to, to develop uh, the, the, uh, the 2D material into a, a very large field. And uh, now the 2D material research is probably one of the most active research areas in condensed matter physics. Well, in the past 16 years, uh, so we have, we, uh, we, we have learned that a uh, lot of materials uh, can be uh, uh, sent down to Mount layer and they, they exhibit a wide variety of, uh, of electronic properties. And at the same time, we accumulated uh, a, a, a very large uh, 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 set of a, experimental techniques that we can use as a tool to start solving outstanding material properties uh, in, in other branches of, uh, uh, of quantum matter physics. Um, for example, the quantum hole physics and magnetism. Uh, and today uh, uh, I will focus on the two uh, uh, areas uh, that I find most interesting, the uh, quantum hole, uh, quantum loss hole physics and high TC superconductivity. Okay, so, so in particular, I will talk about our recent observation of uh, quantum long hole effect in magnesium uh, bismuth telluride uh, one to four structure, and, and, I, uh, and, uh, and also talk about two dimensional high temperature superconducti superconductivity uh, that we, uh, we see in monolinear BISCO. So let me start with uh, the, uh, the uh, quantum long hole effect. So the, the, the idea of the quantum long hole effect Start, started with the question that was raised by uh, Duncan Hall Dane in the 80s. So the question he asked was that, can we see quantum Hall effect in the zero magnet field? Well, his answer was yes. Okay, so indeed he could construct a model to produce quantum Hall Hall effect uh, in certain materials. Uh, through the effort of few generation of service, now we have a recipe uh, to, to look for such materials. So the recipe is, uh, 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 so start like this. So first you start with a three-dimensional topological insulator, okay? The three-dimensional topological insulator have a uh, gapless mode. So the, 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 uh, the gapless mode at all, three, uh, all six phases, okay? And not next, you make it magnetic, okay? You break the time reference symmetry and the, the top and bottom surface, well, the magnetization will, will, will introduce, uh, induce a, a gap, exchange gap uh, at the top and bottom surface. So they, they, uh, so they make them in, uh, insulating. So now the top and bottom surface are insulating, but the edge is still conducting. So they, they uh, but at the same time, if we squeeze the three dimensional uh, three, squeeze the, uh, the, uh, the top line insulator into a thin slab, so that's only one mode is allowed at the edge. And will, you will end up uh, with the, the quantum Hall effect at zero magnet field. And this edge mode will be dispersionist uh, uh, edge mode. Uh, that's, that's the uh, so-called quantum Long's Hall uh, edge state. All right, following this recipe, so this, uh, this uh, 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 Qingxue group at the Tsinghua University um, as first, for the first time discovered this, uh, uh, this, uh, this quantum Long's Hall effect in the magnetic Magnetic doped uh, topological insulator bismuth telluride. Uh, so in back in 2013, so what he found that what they what they did actually is to dope the topological insulator uh, bismuth telluride with chromium, and if you dope enough of chromium, and the, the material will become magnetic. At the same time, they stay as the topological insulator, such that the the recipe that uh, proposed by the series can be realized. And they, they saw this uh, very beautiful composition at low temperatures. Okay, so the trick is uh, to break temperature symmetry with enough magnetic doping. Well, so of course this uh, this has problems. Okay, 
they are determined that the magnetic dopant was random, randomly distributed in the material. Okay, so so you not you need enough of this magnetic dopant, but sometimes these dopants will act as scatter centers. So th they will make the device uh, uh, they, they will make the device dirty. So so in the end, so the uh, because they have this uh, this uh, conflicting uh, demand for this material. And in the end, uh, uh, so the quantization temperature can be reached only up to two Kelvin, and it seems not, not easy to push up the quality of the material to have the, uh, the effect at the higher temperatures. And this actually uh, is a fundamental limit uh, for this approach. Well, um, can we uh, find a material that is intrinsically uh, magnetic, but at the same time still uh, is a couple of insulator? Uh, it sounds too good to be true, but uh, in the last few years, there's a tremendous progress in this front. Well, uh, so, so people, so these people have found that indeed, actually, there's one uh, linear material, uh, uh, magnesium is meteorite, one to four, that, uh, uh, that has its property. Well, if you look into the structure of this material, so if you, for each layer, it has a separate layer of, uh, of atoms, and each layer actually is a ferro, is a ferro magnet, uh, but this uh, the layers a couple antiferromagnetically, uh, antiferromagnetically. So the the bulk MBT is the uh, is the AFM insulator, but if you send it down to odd number layers, uh, because this the the spins are not cancelled exactly, so you end up with a magnetic uh, top log insulator. So so this. In other words, say that it will be a quantum hall, a quantum Lambs hall insulator. And uh, so, to uh, so if you look at the uh, one layer of this material, you find actually it's basically just a bismuth telluride, which is it's uh, which is uh, a topolog typical topological insulator. Uh, it's intercalated by magnesium telluride uh, by layer, and this magnesium will give rise uh, 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 will give rise to the uh, magnet magnetism. Uh, in each layer. Well, so so we uh, so uh, uh, so our collaborator uh, can grow very high quality crystals for us. Uh, so we start to to work on this material uh, uh, two years ago, but uh, there was a problem. So we cannot easily peel a material with the scut tip. Okay. So uh, did I mention that uh, the uh, uh, the material uh, so all the layer material can be pay, uh, can be peeled with a scut tip? Well, uh, so that's not exactly true. Um, so if you look around, there's only a handful of known linear material can be seen down to mon layer with scut tape. So, so, uh, so the, the vast opportunity provided by thousands of uh, uh, two linear materials uh, can be realized only when we can find better way to peel, to exfoliate this, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, materials. So this, in my opinion, is a huge it's it's a it's a bottleneck for the whole field. Well, um, so we've been using scut tape for the past uh, sixteen years. So uh, there got to be a better way to peel uh, the crystals. Well, indeed, actually, there's a way. Um, well, um, so uh, so we uh, uh, so so the idea is uh, actually is the simple. Uh, so we have to find a more sticky tape uh, to peel these materials. Um, so the uh, we found actually, if you if you just develop, if you just deposit a, a, a very thin layer of aluminum oxide uh, to a to the material, and then use that to, as a tape to peel, and actually you can peel the better. So this is the new method for exfoliating those difficult two D materials. Well, this uh, this is the procedure. This uh, cartoon illustrates the procedure for. Of repeating these uh, materials, uh, it looks complicated. But uh, the key idea is just that uh, we use uh, uh, evaporated aluminum oxide to peel the small layers uh, 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 instead of using uh, scar tape. So indeed, with this new peeling method, we could uh, we could uh, get uh, a uh, small layer from very wide range of uh, new materials. For example, FGT, uh, MBT, iron selenide, which is high TC to monoxide and vanadium selenide, MOS2, tantalum disulfide, and, and so on. So indeed, it's very effective. Well, for, for MBT, uh, so these are, are the uh, few linear samples that we obtain with this new uh, PD method, and uh, we can get uh, from one layer to, to, to a few layer and, and, and to the bulk. Uh, 
Well, so uh, so so uh, so so for a so we obtain a five-layer MBT. Uh, uh, so the family MBT is still a top-line splitter, but same time, it basically has an odd number of layers, so it's a very magnetic. And indeed, actually, we see a very nice quantization of the RXY at zero field. And uh, so the RXY reaches 97% uh, of uh, uh, H over E squared the quantum uh, resistance at 1.4K on the zero magnetic field. And uh, it's a... Uh, and so, so what's the, uh, the energy scale of this uh, uh, quantum Lamb's Hall effect? So we can do this by raising the temperature and see the, the thermal fluctuation that will show away the, uh, the contradiction um, uh, uh, in Rx uh, and uh, uh, the Rxy, and at the same time Rx, uh, Rx will, um, uh, will, be, uh, will be larger and larger. Uh, so, so, the, uh, um, so we see that the quantization actually is better at the higher magnetic field. And this is understandable because in higher magnetic field, the high field could polarize the, uh, uh, could uh, polarize all the layers in the material to make a, a stronger ferromagnet uh, uh, fer magnet, so the exchange gap will be much larger. Uh, so a, uh, at 7.6 Tesla, uh, and, uh, so the, uh, the condition could, uh, uh, could persist up to uh, 6.5K. Uh, so by feeding, the uh, the the arc, arc x as a function of one over t, we uh, this is so called Arrhenius plot. Uh, we can get the energy scale of the uh, the condensation gap. So we found actually at zero field the gap the the, the gap is around seven point four k. This is actually already quite a bit larger than the the uh, the gap uh, for the um, for the uh, magnetic doped uh, top uh, And the highest gap value if we well, uh, if we increase the magnetic field, you see that actually the gap uh, increase uh, in steps, and each step represents uh, the flip of one layer. So, if the magnetic field will split the the interfamily coupled uh, the layers one by one, and eventually reach a fully co a polarized uh, a state. And the the highest gap value actually, and in this state, fully polarized state, is around 30k. So, this is actually quite a large uh, energy scale. For quantum Lamb's Hall effect. Okay, now uh, let's pause for a second and, and see what uh, we have, what we'll see. So basically, you take a piece of uh, MBT crystal, which is basically a piece of rock, and, and you get a very thin flake from this crystal, and do nothing to it, and you measure the RxY, and you found actually the, the RxY is exactly quantized. And this quantization, it's precise, in principle precise up to one part in, in, in the billion. Uh, so the same accuracy we can get in the quantum Hall effect, okay? Uh, so, so every time I look at this, and I, I cannot help but thinking uh, uh, about uh, a, a poem by uh, William Blake. So this literally, we're seeing a, a word uh, in the grain of science. So basically this, this, uh, this is uh, the, R, the RxY, basically right now, is determined by the fundamental constant of our universe, uh, the same constant that determines the, the structure of our universe. Well, so, so this is a nice phenomenon, but what's it good for? Well, so we can, uh, so we have, we have this uh, quantum Lamb's Hall effect in, in, a, a, uh, in the same flake of the MBT, but at the same time, we can bring other uh, 2D materials um, to it, and this, uh, uh, and we can build the quantum lumped hole uh, uh, insulator and superconductor header structure. And through the proximity effect, uh, we could uh, possibly have the marginal fermions modes on the edge, and uh, through the uh, uh, through the magnetization of the edge modes, we could possibly uh, bridge this marginal fermions and start to thinking about the building uh, top of qubits. So, so indeed, actually, there's, uh, uh, there's uh, a, uh, a, uh, a very good opportunity for doing the, uh, the, uh, this kind of uh, top of physics uh, with this uh, material. And in principle, uh, so, uh, so in principle, we can make the, uh, the material uh, cleaner and cleaner so, so that we can see a, um, more and more subtle physics uh, in, this, uh, in this new material. And so if you're interested, our paper just published uh, earlier this year. 
and uh, and around the same time, uh, there are very nice work, related works from Yang Yuan Group in Tsinghua University in China, and also Jian Wang Group in Peking University in China. Okay, so now uh, let me uh, switch my gear a little bit and talk about the high temperature subjectivity in multi-year uh, BISCO. So we were we were drawn to this field uh, by a very very curious observation that all the uh, high TC superconductors, uh, including the cupids and also the uh, uh, the uh, the, uh, the iron based superconductors, and they all have this uh, this linear structure. So so uh, so in this sense, they are all 2D or quasi 2D. Um, so I uh, so this is a uh, this is a uh, uh, this is uh, quite uh, uh, confusing to me because uh, what I learned in the textbook is that uh, in 2D, the, the, uh, the superconductivity uh, as a long range order is not stable. So, so it's why the, uh, the nature picks such a, a, a scheme to make a high GC superconductors. So, so I, I asked this question to a, a lot of, to the expert in this field and I got a very different answers from different people. So it seems to me that this is still a uh, an open question. Uh, and at the same time, uh, there is a uh, uh, so at the same time. Uh, so this question also has a uh, a uh, technolog uh, te technological uh, importance because much of what we have known about the high state superconductivity is from surface probe such as STM and RPS. Okay, uh, so so. So this this uh, tools in principle can only probe the surface of a uh, of a, uh, a material. So the superconductivity can only be inferred from the surface uh, from what have known from surface as a surface. So how do we know actually the surface superconductivity is the same as the superconductivity in the bulk? So so to, to me this uh, uh, the uh, this is a uh, is still a, a problem that has to be solved. So in the uh, back in the 90s, um, uh, people have looked at this uh, uh, this problem. Uh, for example, Cho et al. They stick a very large molecules between the layers of BISCO, and they found actually the PC doesn't change that much. Okay, uh, and of course there's a pioneering work from uh, Boswell Group, uh, Group Heaven, and they can grow a uh, heterostructure that only has a uh, a one layer uh, of uh, high C uh, someone uh, in the middle. And they found actually uh, still they can produce the uh, superconductivity uh, even uh, at this uh, uh, thickness. Well, so all this uh, suggests that uh, the the HTC this uh, the cupid um, uh, HTC superconductor is more or less two dimensional. Well, ideally we still want to get to the the outer limit. So can we produce a clean uh, HTC uh, uh, mount layer as ultimate two D limit uh, and and see how the TC uh, how, how the superconductivity change or not, and so so the uh, uh, so uh, uh, as a a, a, uh, uh, a member of the two D community, so we uh, we have the the, the power of, of a scar tape, a magic tape. So, uh, but of course we're not the first one to try this. Um, so uh, actually, in the past ten years, uh, uh, there's uh, quite a few groups actually who tried this uh, uh, approach. And if, uh, for example, uh, Jiang Da et al. Uh, in, back in 2014, they uh, produced a half uh, a half in the cell of BIS, uh, BISM 212, and they found actually the TC decreased a lot uh, compared to the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the bulk BISCO. Well, but before we attribute this uh, uh, the TC uh, decrease uh, to dimensionality effect, we had to uh, be careful because uh, when we uh, compare the TC uh, of different samples. Yeah, we have to make sure that the when comparing the TC at exactly the same doping. And this is not easy to, to achieve because when we produce the um, the mount layers, the, the mount layer may, may degrade. So we have to solve this problem before we could uh, uh, do a detailed comparison or de uh, a detailed study of this uh, uh, the uh, Yuanbo, the high uh, activity. Question, Yuanbo. Uh, okay. Yeah, quite quite uh, how, how consistently can you produce a, a monolayer of high TC using, mm -hmm. using the scotch tape method? Uh, well, it's uh, actually once you, you know how to do it, actually, it's, it's quite uh, straightforward. Mm -hmm. 
So the student could uh, spend half a day and get uh, a couple of uh, samples uh, they can work with. Oh, that's pretty impressive. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so actually, uh, it took us a couple of years to, to get to this point. Um, so, but uh, the trick we found is actually quite simple. Um, so, uh, so for an entire fabrication process, it had, it had to be in an inert atmosphere. So we, we work in a uh, argon uh, field glove box. At the same time, we have to keep the, uh, the sample at low temperatures um, at minus 40 uh, degrees C. Okay, so this is all you need to uh, uh, get in this intrinsic uh, on, uh, uh, high quality uh, monolayer or bilayer biscuit. Well, um, so I have to make clear. So, uh, so when I uh, say monolayer, uh, so I'm following the convention in 2D material community. So one monolayer in this case actually is a half unit cell for bismuth 2212. And the half unit cell bismuth 2212 has two copper acid planes. Okay, so basically we are, we are seeing actually one of this, uh, uh, this layer. And uh, so, this, uh, uh, so once we have a, uh, a piece like this, uh, a model layer like this, then we can press uh, the uh, contact on top. And this is what, uh, done by Yi Jin Yu, Li Guoma, and Cai Peng over here. And uh, <coughs> and with this, we can measure the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, resistivity as a function of the temperature. We found that the first thing we found actually the the monolayer bismuth to the one two is still a high heat superconductor. It has a very sharp uh, a uh, transition, just as sharp as the that in the bulk. Okay. Well, um, uh, again, so if we want to compare the TC with the bulk, we have to make sure it's uh, the same doping level. Okay. Uh, for that, we have to be able to tune the TC of a monolayer. And so this is the one of the huge advantage of the uh, working with mount layers. Uh, uh, it's uh, easily tunable. Uh, so it's not easy to tune, tune the, the doping level of bulk, but it's uh, very easy to tune the doping level in the mount layer. So if you want to increase, uh, if you want to increase the, uh, the uh, oxygen doping, basically all you need actually is to anneal your sample slightly uh, in the ozone environment, okay? Uh, and if you want to, to decrease the doping to extract the oxygen out of the, uh, the mount layer, and you can basically just uh, gently anneal it in vacuum. And this, uh, uh, this will actually attune the, uh, can tune the GTC back and forth. Yuanbo, uh, we have a number yes. of uh, questions in the chat. Can I uh, uh, interrupt you to pose a few? Oh, sure, of course, of course. Uh, uh, the first one is from uh, Silke Buda Passion. Silke, would you like to pose your question? Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Silke. Um, you, you introduced uh, the, the superconductivity via the 2D-ness. So heavy fermion compounds are typically rather 3D, but also feature high TC superconductivity. Uh, does that fit into your picture? Uh, uh, sorry, I, I uh, couldn't hear your question uh, clearly. Uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, could you say that again? Okay, so so um, heavy fermion compounds uh, are also feature mm -hmm. high TC superconductivity, <laughs> but are rather three D. Um, oh yes. Mm -hmm. So 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 what do you say about the the importance of two D ness then for for this uh -huh. kind of superconductivity? Um, well, uh, we would love to to get our hands on this uh, heavy fermion uh, materials, uh, but unfortunately, uh, so we. So it's those are, you know, like you said, it's a uh, three-dimensional material. They cannot, uh, uh, we cannot peel uh, down to mount layers. Uh, so all we can see that uh, that uh, if we, uh, um, even for cuprates, actually, most of the cuprates cannot be uh, peeled down to mount layer. Uh, uh, but uh, all we can see is that actually for bismuth 212, if you get to mount layer, it still has a, a high TC superconductivity. Uh, th there's another question from Andre Nevodomsky. Andre, would you like to ask your question? Um, yes, I'm trying to shorten it. Um, so, uh, Yuan Bo, you're probably aware of the suggestions that if you have a 3D topological insulator, mm -hmm. in principle, if you could put a thin ferromagnetic film on the top, yes. Yes. then you kind of have a spintronic type of device. And in yes. particular, if you have a ferromagnetic layer pointing up and right mm -hmm. next to it another domain with ferromagnetic field pointing down, mm -hmm. along the edge, you expect to find a one-dimensional conductor. Now, oh, yes. in your first part of the talk, MTB, yes. MBT, yes. 
uh, is naturally a ferromagnet. It naturally would have the mains. And the yes. question is, would you expect to see such 1D conducting channels? And do you have techniques, for instance, microwave impedance spectroscopy to measure those? Oh, uh, yes, actually, uh, so I think uh, the, uh, the fact that we see the, uh, the uh, exact contradiction of the edge state uh, show that uh, indeed we do have a dissipationist edge state. Um, so, uh, well, uh, so your question is uh, how uh, can we probe this, uh, the, the edge state uh, uh, with a local uh, probe, right? Um, so we love to do it. Um, so indeed, uh, uh, so uh, indeed, uh, the uh, the uh, few groups actually are are, uh, are contacting us. Uh, so to see the possibility of using their um, their local probes to see such uh, such state. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's possible. Yes. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, two. Uh, we'll, we'll have one more question, then we'll let you get on a little bit. Um, we'll come back. Uh, Greg Bobinger asks uh, today how precisely. Has the uh, quantized Hall effect been measured as a quantized? How accurately has the quantization been measured to date? You mentioned one part in a billion. Uh, how, oh, quant how quantum been? anomalous Hall effect. How well, precisely oh, oh, is it? The <laughs> yeah. Quantum, yeah, quantum Hall effect actually was measured up to one uh, uh, one part in billion. Uh, but the quantum anomalous Hall effect, as far as I know, uh, it's, uh, it has not reached such an accuracy. Oh, yeah, in our case, in our case, we see uh, we see a most ninety eight percent composition, but at the temperature of uh, one point four K. So we we expect that we can see a more exact composition. Probably, I think I guess actually one one uh, like uh, ninety nine point nine percent composition uh, at uh, milli milli Kelvin uh, uh, temperatures, uh, but uh, uh, but. Uh, uh, but I think that there is a mainly, if you want to reach the uh, one part in the billion, it's mainly a material problem. We, see we have to get much cleaner materials. Okay, thank I'm you. I'm not so sure of that, but it, we'll, we oh. can talk later. Okay, okay, yeah, <laughs> okay. All right, uh, okay, uh, let me continue uh, with the HTC uh, experiment. All right, so so we could uh, in the, for the past day, uh, two uh, two years uh, we uh, so we found a way to produce uh, the high quality intrinsic uh, 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 mount layer and bi layers of bismuth uh, two to one two, and we found that actually uh, it's uh, it still has a TC as high as that in the bulk. Okay, so and we also found a way to tune the TC back and forth um, uh, through a, ver uh, a uh, through a very large part of the uh, the whole. A phase diagram, and here is actually the uh, the data, and we can cover a, a a large part of the phase diagram. And so it's very important actually we cover the the the, the highest point of the dome because that's where we want to compare the TC precisely with the bulk. Okay, and once we do that, we found actually so here's the the monolayer TC uh, uh, in uh, on, the, on the left, and on the right is the TC of the optimal doped bulk. Uh, you see that there's a spread uh, for the bulk TC because um, uh, this material is not exactly homogeneous. Okay, uh, but you see that the uh, the highest uh, TC uh, of the mount layer, which represents the TC of the best uh, mount layer sample, is uh, already with, within the range of the bulk TC. So from this, we conclude that uh, the highest TC mount layer is almost the same as the, in the bulk. Okay. Uh, uh, within uh, the uncertainty in, uh, in our uh, experiment. Well, uh, so, uh, but in, the, in, in BISCO, there's much more uh, to, the, uh, to the TC, uh, in fact. Uh, so, uh, so most of these, uh, uh, so they has actually a very complicated phase diagram. And those, uh, this part of the phase diagram is best accessed uh, with uh, a scanning probe experiment such as STM. And so for that, we modify our STM so that we can, we can locate uh, a very small piece of uh, a BISCO inside our STM in situ uh, and take STM measurement. So the first thing we check is the topography. And we see that actually the Mount Lear Isthmus uh, 212 is very clean. Uh, and, uh, you, so if I, I don't tell you it's Mount Lear, actually you probably didn't realize. Um, so the only difference actually, it has a very large scale corrugation. Uh, uh, 
um, and this is understandable because uh, the uh, the substrate we use for this experiment is uh, sitting oxide, is uh, which is uh, amorphous, so that the monolinear bismuth, uh, monolinear bismuth two to one two will follow the curvature uh, of the uh, the surface. Uh, but if you look at the atomic structure, actually it's uh, identical to that in the, uh, of the buck. Well, uh, like I said, the, 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 uh, there's a lot more to bismuth 2212 uh, than the GC, and they have very complicated uh, phase diagram. Um, so, uh, so we want to look at the surfaces one by one uh, in the mile year uh, limit. Okay, first, uh, let's look at the pseudo gap. Well, the pseudo gap man, uh, so show up as a, a, a soft gap above GC, and indeed, uh, so for a, a, a optimum doped uh, mile layer, we said actually, uh, even at the 110K, we see a, a gap, uh, uh, a, a soft gap. So, so the pseudo gap is still there, okay, uh, in mile layer. And now let's look at the thermal activity uh, uh, in, in mile layer. And in STM, this is usually proved by, by, uh, by confining uh, the energy, the tunnel energy within the gap. And look at the, uh, how the, the, uh, the electro, uh, how the, uh, the, uh, the quasi particles scatter of the impurities. And this scatter uh, between the, uh, the points, uh, eight points in the, um, in the, in the, in the, band, in the band structure. So uh, the, the eight points has the highest joint density state. Uh, so, so in the first transform of your DIDV map, in your density state map, you will see actually this uh, scattering events will show up as, uh, as uh, points Okay, as a uh, discrete points on the uh, on the first transform uh, image, and we see all all the points except for one, which is too too weak uh, uh, to be observed. So so this in a way confirms the octane model are still are still valid uh, in in mount layer. So from the dis for, uh, so if you change the tunneling energy, you see that the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the interference will disperse with energy. Okay. Uh, from the dispersion, we can back out the shape of the, um, uh, the, the shape of the firm surface and also the, the, uh, the gap structure of monolinear bismuth uh, 2212. I guess it's not, it's not surprising that we recover the same D wave gap in monolinear bismuth 2212. Okay. So now can, uh, we, can, we can look at the, uh, the charge order. So the charge order show up as the um, uh, I, as a spot uh, in the uh, in the DIDV uh, map in the underdoped uh, bismuth two to one two, and this uh, this uh, spot actually is just one quarter uh, of the uh, of the unit uh, uh, vector in the in the first brain zone, and we see the same thing. Uh, 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 we, we see the spot and the same spot as in the bulk. Okay, and just as uh, the the uh, part, uh, the charge order in 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 bulk bismuth two to one two. And they, they get this uh, charge order uh, peaks uh, get weakened in the optimum doped uh, basement to the one tool and eventually disappear in the up uh, in the uh, over doped uh, uh, region. So so this is again uh, there's no surprising here. So uh, so um, so now finally let's look at the mock insulation regime. Okay, uh, this is not easy to do actually in, in the park because it's very difficult to drive away all the oxygen uh, in, this, in, in, in group phase. Uh, but, uh, uh, but it's easy to do actually uh, to do uh, in, this, in more layers. Uh, so basically we will kneel harder in, in, UH, uh, in, in vacuum. And uh, we can actually within the same sample, we can start with the, up, uh, with the almost op optimum top sample and all the way uh, uh, push, it, push it all the way to the uh, insulator regime. Uh, so we see that uh, in, in the multi insulated regime, the sample is very inhomogeneous, okay? Uh, uh, so in some part of the surface, we see a mud gap. And, and in other part of the surface, we see the gap slowly um, evolve into a pseudo gap. So uh, it does so by pushing the, the density of state uh, outside the gap, slowly into the gap, and form this uh, pseudo gap uh, structure. Okay, uh, so this is what I've seen, uh, what we have seen in, in monolinear basement 212. And if you compare that uh, with the, what, what, uh, 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 what people seen in, in bulk basement 201 in the same region, you found that the behavior is very similar. So basically we see that they, even the mild insulating uh, gap is, uh, is no different uh, in, in, um, in monolinear basement 212. 
And, and this, uh, as you mentioned, actually, this work is uh, done by Cai Peng et al. from, uh, from Ya Yuan Group in Tsinghua University. So, so, uh, so finally, uh, we found, uh, we can conclude that uh, the, all the essential physics in basement 2212 uh, two two is contained in uh, its Mount layer. So basically, the new physics we, 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 we discovered uh, in Mount layer business, uh, uh, in Mount Lear 212 actually is nothing new <laughs> in, in, in Mount layer. So, um, um, so, um, so this, uh, uh, this, again, this work is uh, uh, published uh, 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 last year. Um, so if you feel brief, you can even uh, you can even see that uh, the the high GC superactivity in in uh, basement two to one two is basically a two dimensional phenomenon. So so um, so what next? Um, so now we have a thousands of linear materials. And so what I shown here are just uh, two examples uh, that we have worked on. So definitely, um, so there's a, a vast opportunity. Uh, ahead of us uh, by by looking at these uh, linear materials uh, from this uh, uh, 2D material uh, point of view and try to develop new ways uh, to get those materials. And a, a lot of those materials actually are metallic. And they are, um, the, so it's not easy to tune the, uh, the doping level uh, of this material using conventional getting method. So, so they, I think the next opportunity is to develop new methods to modulate the material property of, this, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the, uh, the layers, even if they are metallic. And actually there are already ways of doing this. So for example, the ionic gating and also the, uh, the assignation that demonstrated in our uh, experiment for basement 2212. And finally, uh, this, uh, I, uh, I haven't touched upon another uh, area of the 2D material research, uh, uh, so which we have, uh, which have attracted a lot of attention recently is to stack them up uh, like a four year old would do uh, with their toys. So, um, so already uh, by stacking up uh, a, uh, a graphene uh, layers with a small uh, twist angle, uh, a few groups uh, like Hario, uh, Hario group in MIT, Fumon group in UC Berkeley and their young group in UC Santa Barbara. And they have already discovered that you can make the system super, super, super duct or, uh, uh, or uh, see the quantum lumps Hall effect in those uh, twisted uh, graphene systems. So, and if you, if you consider it, there are thousands of the such materials uh, 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 to work with, and the possibilities basically are, are, are endless. So, uh, so as, a, as the uh, worker in the, uh, uh, in the 2D material uh, community, I always feel like a, you know, a kid running on the beach. So we can find a piece of this and piece of that, uh, uh, in, uh, you know, a seashell here and there. But I, uh, I feel that, uh, I constantly feel actually there's a big ocean out there. Um, so if we, um, if we, so if we explore and if we find uh, a even, uh, you know, we can find the ocean that give us give rise to all these uh, beautiful things. Uh, and uh, I think uh, as a community, we're getting there. So with that, uh, let me summarize. So uh, we, we observed the quantized on Mount Hall effect uh, in magnetic uh, top block insulator in MBT. Uh, and uh, uh, we can see it down uh, the, the basement 2212 uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, to the model linear limit and you still see the high system activity. Uh, so finally, uh, let me uh, conclude my slide by acknowledging my, uh, my co-workers. So the, uh, the, uh, the work uh, was not possible without students, uh, uh, the effort. So, the, uh, so we, uh, uh, so Yijun Deng, Yijun Yuan, Li Guoma, and Peng Cai, and Meng uh, Zhu uh, was the, the person mainly responsible for the two projects here, uh, presented here. And we uh, collaborate with, uh, closely with uh, uh, Wang Jing Group, uh, with, uh, who does theory for, uh, for us, and also from, uh, with Xian Huichen Group, who provide the high quality MBT uh, crystals. Uh, we also get MBT crystals from Six Carbon Technology, and, uh, and also Guggenda Group, and uh, Isaki Group uh, uh, in US, and also in Japan. Okay, uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Let's all uh, unmute for a second and thank uh, Rambo for a wonderful talk.
now we have time for uh, uh, about five or ten minutes of questions. There's loads of questions coming. Let me uh, uh, first pass the mic to Yuan Wei Zhang. Uh, could you, would you like to unmute your mic and ask a question, Yuan Wei? Yeah, hello, everyone. Yeah, my question is that, will you please explain more about the mechanism using the uh, aluminum ox oxide for peeling? Is it because oh. the chemical bond between the aluminum oxide and the 2D materials is stronger than the VDW bond in the 2D materials itself? And mm -hmm. that's my first question. And you mm -hmm. can go ahead for the first one. Thank you. OK. <laughs> so uh, so here, let me get to that slide. Uh, OK. OK. So uh, so what we think, actually, uh, <coughs> that when, when you uh, evaporate the thin layer of aluminum oxide, it will make a very in intimate contact with the surface. OK. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so it's very different from, uh, from peeling you know, uh, on, the, on, the alumina, uh, on the sitting oxide surface, because the sitting oxide surface is not flat. So basically, if you press a bulk uh, material uh, to, the, uh, to the surface, only, uh, the only touch is at, at, uh, uh, you know, at a few points, I think. So, so even if there's a, a very strong Benavas uh, interaction between them, so you, you, you don't get the full benefit, okay? Uh, but uh, this, uh, uh, with aluminum oxide evaporated on, on top, uh, you, you, the, um, you know, the contact area will be much larger. So this, I think, is the, the, uh, um, is the, um, is the main reason uh, we could uh, peel uh, better with aluminum oxide. Um, so I, I don't think they form a bonds uh, to the surface um, because if you form bonds uh, with the material, uh, you will notice uh, the, the material quality will, will, will degrade. Um, so we don't see that much. Oh, thank you. Uh, for the second question, have you ever tried other oxides? Oh, um, so we, ha we didn't have a chance yet. <laughs> so it will be, it will be best uh, if we try all the oxide and then uh, and then pick up the best uh, uh, but uh, uh, we chose aluminum oxide because uh, uh, depositing aluminum oxide is a, is a well established procedure and and also uh, aluminum oxide is um, of course it's not, um, it's easy to uh, to deposit um, so so that's why we we, we choose the uh, we, we do it first and turn out it uh, works very well so we we, we guess we, we, we stuck with it Okay. Uh, my last question is that uh, does this technique work for all kinds of 2D materials or only limited to uh, MBT? Uh, I wish, uh, but uh, it, it doesn't. <laughs> so, um, uh, so it can work with a, a, a wide range of materials, uh, but however, it doesn't work for all the materials. And so, the uh, uh, so from two D to three D, actually, this uh, it's a it's a contingent spectrum. Uh, so some material is extremely hard to, to peel, even if it, it, it's a structure, uh, it's uh, it's quasi two D. Uh, so um, so, but we we can um, but this method actually can work with a wider range of two D materials. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, Bruce Gordon has a question. Bruce. Uh, yes, thank you. Very interesting talk. Um, I've got what I think is a simple question. Uh, and that given the surface sensitivity of the STM measurements, um, you're comparing uh, monolayer bismuth 2212 to the surface layer of a, of a bulk sample. And so yes, I, I guess, um, how do you know that the what you're comparing to um, the surface layer of a bulk sample is the same as the actual bulk. Uh, oh, very good question. Um, so, so basically, um, uh, yes, we don't know. So, in principle, we 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 we, we don't know. Um, so, the um, well, so basically, we're comparing our STM result actually with the previous STM results. So, be, because the previous all previous re STM or RP result was obtained uh, uh, on the surface. Uh, so. Uh, so basically, we are comparing this tool. We found actually, even if you send it down to mount layer, the result doesn't change. Okay, so this uh, this uh, could uh, uh, so in a way it could uh, could uh, actually justify uh, that you can prove actually uh, the the uh, the bulk uh, the subjectivity uh, just by probing the uh, the first layer. Actually, one uh, quick uh, follow-up question. So you're always looking at uh, bilayers, is that correct? You're always looking at an even number of layers, no matter uh, no matter how the uh, um, the uh, scotch tape method uh, goes, uh, and it's not possible to do this for like um, LSCO, for example, or is that correct? 
Uh, well, uh, again, that's a very good question. So uh, I, I didn't have time to talk about our recent work on, uh, on this uh, Bismuth 2201 uh, yet. So for Bismuth 2201, uh, indeed, actually, if you get a mount layer, the mount layer have only one copper side plane. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. And so we can get the, so, but however, actually, we, uh, the result we got actually is uh, very similar to Bismuth 2212. So with possibly a, uh, a, a, um, a, a, uh, a one uh, difference. Uh, so the TC of the Mount-Lear Bismuth 201 seem to be suppressed slightly. Right. Yeah. Okay, so, oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we have a lot of questions here. Let me, Andrea says he wants to make a brief remark. Andrea Damascelli, would you like to make a brief remark? Yeah, so <clears throat> in relation to the last question, now, is it uh, the work done on a single monolayer by STM in particular comparable to or relevant to the bulk? I just wanted to point out that, you know, the work that we had done with X-ray, so resonant X-ray on BISCO, 2212 and 2201, actually matches very well the work that was done by STM, for instance, for Seamus Davis. So to some degree, you know, you have done the, the work by STM, which is very nice, it's consistent with 2212, and indirectly we have seen that that matches the bug. So I would take it, as you put it, as a, you know, a, a demonstration that you are seeing of a single monolayer, what also exists for the bulk sample. So the connection is through the X-ray that was basically validating all of Seamus's work. Yeah, That's thank it. you. Uh, Jim Allen, Jim, you've had your hand raised for a long time. Uh, what's your question? Yeah, uh, if the high TC is a, a 2D phenomena, does that rule out any of the theories of high TC? or favor one another uh, strongly? So, uh, yeah, uh, thank you for your question. Perhaps we should ask the uh, uh, theorist. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, any idea, uh, Piers? I, I'm not gonna get involved with this, but I would like to point out that most theories are basically two-dimensional. And so, um, but, but what about costlitz Thaulus? Shouldn't there be a costlet stylus transition? Shouldn't it be a rather different transition than the bulk? Yeah, very good uh, question. So, yes. Um, so, unfortunately, right now, uh, we haven't seen the, uh, the Bikini transition in many years. So, we tried very hard, okay? Mm. Uh, but we haven't seen it. Mm. Um, so, so, but, but uh, there, we are trying to rule out uh, the, uh, uh, um, so some possibilities. For example, in, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, the residue ma uh, magnetic field, uh, the or the noise, uh, you know, because we have to get to very low uh, noise level. So, uh, so if we do it uh, in in the high current limit, actually, uh, it won't work. So, so we are trying to to work out all the details and try to to look at this uh, big D transition uh, uh, very carefully. Uh, but so far, we haven't seen it. Okay, uh, we're going to have time for some very short questions. Ina, you have a question. Ina Bishik. Yes, uh, thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, my question um, is on the monolayer BISCO and uh, specifically the resistivity phase diagram, what's happening at higher temperature. So um, I'm wondering if the pseudo gap onset uh, is the same as the bulk and also if there's a regime of uh, linear uh, resistivity above Q star. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so indeed. Uh, so we have. Um, so we we look at this uh, uh, this linear resistivity and also the pseudo gap. Uh, and so uh, it's uh, actually the more detail in our paper. Uh, so um, um, so indeed, uh, we have seen the deviation uh, from linear behavior uh, uh, in in the um, in the resistivity, and uh, from that we can attract a, a any scale uh, or temperature scale for a pseudo gap, and it's matched with the the, the bulk measurement. Okay, look, um, we've got, we could probably keep the chat going for another half hour, but unfortunately, uh, we're going to have to close things off right now. So I must apologize for the two or three questions that are still out there. Um, I think we should thank Yuanbo for a wonderful talk, and we'll have a very brief uh, break for two or three minutes before we start up the next session. Okay, let's unmute and thank Yuanbo. Oh, thank you. Okay, we will resume literally. Well, I, I suggest we, we have a three minute break and start, uh, start in three minutes time. Okay, thank you very much.